I was in Southern California, if you, you know, if you're from the Northwest and you go to California and you see an orange on a tree, does anybody go up to it and go, is that real? Have you done that before? Because we're not used to oranges on trees and they, that's where they grow, is oranges on trees. Our, our theme here this summer at, at Christ the King, not here just at North Bay, but across our network, is a theme called Flourish. And our desire, and I guess personally even share where, you know, summer is a great time to relax. Summer is a great time to lessen the schedules and the, and the, the, the you know, the vigorous things that we try to kind of cram maybe in our, in our year. Some of us will, you know, get the opportunity to take vacation. Uh, and, and it's great to do that. I love my hammock. I, I love times of just being by the beach and everything to do that. But I found, too, in my relaxed state, sometimes I can kind of lax on my, my faith in the sense of I'm still a Christian. I'm still wanting to grow in Jesus. But what I'll do is maybe kind of slip a little bit in the disciplines of the things that I'm doing. It, they all kind of tie together. What, maybe I'm getting some rest and sleeping a little more, but then I can kind of get lazy maybe in my devotional life. Uh, maybe you have found that this is true where maybe you know, cutting back, like cutting back on t- attending church, uh, and, and, and just for a variety of reasons, and so we can kind of slowly drift, and maybe kind of flounder our faith a little bit, maybe at the end of the summer, we, we actually don't really feel like we're stronger in our faith, and maybe a little bit weaker, and so we just like, you know, let's just be pro- proactive this year, let's, let's push in some intentionality of, of growing and flourishing, last week we opened across our campuses in John chapter 15 about if we want to stay connected, we have to choose to be connected uh, in, in a very much a withering world around us and it's through staying connected to the vine who's Jesus and so that's our desire is that we would bear fruit through Christ as we stay connected to him and the way we do that is some introducing some practices of, of, of growth and spiritual practices the Bible talks about how that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to act and will according to his good purpose so as God's working in us, also God's working through us, and that we're, there's work that we're to do. Uh, if, if you want to grow in any kind of disciplines, you've got to be disciplined about it and take some steps. And so we've introduced, we're going to be introducing different spiritual practices throughout the summer. Not only myself, but you get to hear from actually a variety of speakers this summer that will be coming in and sharing with that. Another resource that we put together is called More Than a Hike. Uh, last week, if you were here, you had the opportunity to, to get a copy. If you didn't get one, there's maybe three or four left back there. And so this is your opportunity to grab one on the way out. Some of you, the last song, will be back there grabbing your copy. Um, if there is some left out, there's a little clipboard, and we will special print a copy for you. You can also access a, a digital. There's an, an interactive opportunity there online under our growth guides on our website. And there's a flourish landing page, so CTK Church slash Flourish, there's actually some videos and some devotional things, some more resources available to do that. But Sunday is, is our focus uh, to, do, to do that. Um, and so today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about confession. We're going to talk about confession. Now confession is an interesting thought, isn't it? Because when I hear the word confession, two things come to mind. One is this, is, is I watch enough police shows that, that you, you see someone in a, in a room, and there's bright lights, and there's a two-way mirror, and they, they you know, some detective, and he's, you know, kind of rough kind of guy, and he's just like, he's like, we got you, it's, you're ready, we, we've seen you, we got footage, you just need to confess, you just get this over with, we don't need to mess around any longer, and then they're like, I need to see my lawyer, you know, on this whole drama, and it's the same thing, right, we love these shows, but you notice it's the same formula as we, do, we watch these things. The other, the other thing about confession is in a religious standpoint is when I was a child um, and in the church I was part of, they, you go to church and then on the, to the like, right of the pews, there was like these little closets. And, and people would go in and some people would come out. No, they, they, you know, <laughs> they would go in for a while and they come out and like, what goes on in there, you know? And then one day my, my dad, we were driving by the church and he says, I, I want to go to confession. And so I went in with him, and I think I was about 10 years old, and he goes, do you want to do this? And I'm like, ooh, I don't know, maybe. And, and I don't, you know, I didn't even really understand any of it, really. 
And, and, and so he went in there, and then he came out, which was good. And then, then he said, do you want to go in there? And I went in there, and he, I said, well, what do I do? And say, just say, Father, I've sinned. That's what you're supposed to say. So I go into the confession booth, and I said, you know, and then first I'm like, I'm in the room, and there's like, it's a little light, and then they're it's small, you know, and then there's, there's this like little door thing, and then there's this lattice and little curtain, and then there's this guy with a profile. And he's not even looking at me. He's just looking that way. I'm like, what is he looking at? And then, and then, and then, and then, you know, I just don't know. I'm 10. And, and, and so, you know, and then, he, and then I said, Father, Father, I've sinned. And then he says, Son, you may proceed. And I'm like, proceed with what? I don't know exactly what. So, you know, then he kind of goes, you know, some things you want to confess. And I said, well, you know, I'm 10, right? I'm like, shot my dog, my neighbor's dog with a BB gun. I cut in line at lunch with a kid. Then I went back to preschool. I pushed a kid down and took a toy. I mean, how far do I go back on this stuff? You know what I mean? And I don't know. And I came out of that, not in a bad experience, but kind of a weird experience going, I don't know what, to, I don't even know what to do with that. And then I found as I, later as I developed in my faith, as I really came into a personal faith in Jesus, that I don't know if that's how, and again, nothing wrong with that way but I but for me I've discovered there, there's something about Jesus that I can just come to him and confess in this relationship with him but that's so opposite of the religious mindset not only that we we talk about confession which is going to be the the spiritual conversation we're going to talk about practicing confession that, there's a religious shame and guilt that fills with that confession, but it's also in our world, too. The world we live in is kind of interesting because what I found is people, uh, they, they're very open about their lives nowadays. People share all kinds of things, and, and when they do sometimes, it's interesting the response of people. And what I, what I, what I found is, is that either there's, on one hand, there's, judgmental religious fundamental people that claim to be christians were very judgy and we're like ah, that's not love what jesus talks about but on the other hand there can be these pretentious progressives who are who are arrogant and self-righteous and i find that there's two extremes there that both kind of hide their shortcomings because it's easier to put that blame on someone else on what they're that way and versus your own hypocrisy and, and so we're either trained at a level to hide in, in a church environment, because in a church environment, maybe you grew up where if you did say something, what you're going through, you could feel shame towards you or even shunning towards you, okay? And, and our culture, we do the opposite. They go, well, you don't have to feel bad about that. You just feel good about yourself. And yet this you-do-you you mentality, it it. If there's something on a, I guess on a, a primal level that it doesn't work. Have you discovered that? That when it comes down to yourself and your own, maybe your own faith journey, we still battle guilt, don't we? We still battle shame. And, and what we do sometimes, and we pray this prayer, and there's nothing wrong with praying this prayer, God help me not feel bad about myself. And, and there's nothing right. The Bible says this, if you follow Jesus, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So don't, don't miss that. I, there's a place for that. But there's also a place of being ruthlessly honest with yourself in your struggles and what you're going through. And, and it's really simply praying this prayer, Lord, help me know my sins. When we do that, when we, we cre again, we create this kind of ruthless self-awareness, and really it's the depravity of our own sinful nature. And yet we live in this culture, and, this, and, and it's really, we'd say, almost a self-esteem movement that's happened over the last 30 or 40 years. Listen, don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with good self-esteem. But self-esteem only goes so far. You know, if you're here all the time, you're beautiful. You're just the way you are. If you, you know, don't change anything about you. Just people need to accept you for you, okay? You hear those messages over and over. And yet what we find is this, that the self-esteem movement is actually a crock. <laughs> what they find, behavioral scientists, this is outside the you know, Christian realm, have learned that just self-esteem enough is actually doing damage to people. If they're not being brutally honest with themselves and where they're at and, and finding a place of reality, two extremes happen with people. They become very perfectionists. 
They very much are, they got to get everything right and every, look at everything, and if any of the pieces fall apart, everything crumbles. It's either you got it all figured together or a completely opposite happens. And perfectionism, it's, it, it makes people, it really makes people a lot, a lot of anxiousness and anxiety that happens. The other thing is hopelessness. So here's the ideal where you're trying to live up a certain way. Maybe you grew up where it, there's a church environment, religious standards or academic standards or just performance standards that you, you try to follow. People put pressure on you. And somebody that's too much, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want. I, I'm a, I, if, I, if I have to do all this to get to heaven, man, I'm just going to live like hell. And I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. And there's the opposites happen. And what they found is in this self-esteem movement, it's not working. And it's led to levels and levels of anxiety and especially for youth and young adults right now, is a huge problem. It's an epidemic right now. So p- positive self-talk, it's actually great PR, it's great marketing, but it doesn't help us. And we're getting duped left and right about this. Deep down, we, we come to the place, and you know this, you know you to a level that you're broken. <laughs> you know, there is some, you and I, there is some problems, right? There's issues that we have that we all know that we need to be saved, that we need to be healed, that we need to, we need to find wholeness and freedom, as Chris was telling us, to encourage us today, that many of us have found that, but there's still work to be done in our, and so when we come to the places, we come to the fact that we need all that outside of ourselves. Someone or something has to do that outside of us, and that's why the good news of Jesus is so good. The good news is Jesus that not only are we saved from our sins, but we are saved from ourself. We are saved from our shame. We are saved from this, this, this level of depravity that we're that, that's heading down the wrong road and a destructive road in our lives. True spiritual transformation comes face to face with this reality that we of who we really are. Confession is just coming to this place and realizing who. We really are. I love what the Hebrew book of Hebrews says. This is in the message version. I don't know if you've ever read this way. It's, it's, it's really kind of this addressing this whole idea of propping yourself up. It's not really working. I love how it's written here. It says, so come on. Let's leave the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up in Christ. The basic foundation truths are in place. Turning your back on salvation by self-help and turning in trust toward God. We, we read that in a basic level, trusting God, and we know that. But we're trusting in a God that's not the, just a God that is a judge and condemner, but we're turning to a God of mercy and compassion that wants deep connection with us, and that happens through a relationship with Jesus— as we talked last week, staying connected to the vine. Jesus says, I am the man, bri- vine, you are the branches. A, rem- a man remains in me and I in him. Uh, he will stay connected. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And this connection that we have, it's there. And so confession is this pathway to that connection. This, this, con- this work of confession, I-, I think it's a good one to start with as we move through the summer on these spiritual practices to start with this, to kind of pave the way as we're going to talk here at the end about the place of vulnerability that we go in our life and relationship with Jesus. Now the word confession in Greek, and I'm going to I don't speak Greek, so and a lot of you don't either, so you don't know how to pronounce it either but it's, it's exum elagio, which basically and I butcher that I'm sure you get the word exam and logic so I think it's a good idea to understand this, that, that, that confession is taking ample time to examine your whole self to look at your entire self. It's almost like a body scan. Has anybody had a CAT scan? Are you in the room here? Have you, can you, raise your hand? Have you had an MRI before? Okay, are those just the most nerve-wracking experiences? An MRI, have you ever had that? Where, and they try to maybe give you headphones, and then they have like a, a, like a mine was like, they had this like picture of a waterfall, it was in a, in the, but it was all kind of crumbling, and it's like, it's like, that's not helpful. Like, get a better p- poster I'm looking at. Because they're trying to distract you from... Are you with me? Everybody knows that. You're laughing because you know exactly. Some of you are like, whoa, that guy's lost it. What's going on? That's what you experience for several minutes, right? 
I say all that is it's kind of like annoying. It's kind of like you're going, but what are you doing as a body scan? I mean, like, I mean, like, if I'm here, scan everything. I mean, you know, it's like taking your car and like, okay, that's broken. That needs to be fixed. I want to know everything. And that's what we're kind of doing with our coming into, to the Lord in confession. And this is what the psalmist writes how to do this. He says, test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. It's a bold, risky prayer. You're laying on the MRI table and like, scan me, my soul scan, Lord, what is it there? Take a shot of this, show me. But here's in the context when he does this. For I've always been mindful of your unfailing love and I lived in reliance of your faithfulness. So confession is through coming before, not in a place of shame and condemnation, but coming through a loving, compassionate God and his faithfulness to us and this amazing, unfailing love. What it tells us is when he knows all of us, which he knows already, he makes it aware of us, of how, where we are, we are in reality with him. And then what does he do? He doesn't give up on the love. It's unfailing love through that. So the one who knows you the best loves you the most. Isn't that powerful? And so when we approach it that way, we understand that, but, but we live with shame, we live with guilt, we live with these feelings of confession that we get caught up, either religious, religious condemnation or, or the world itself we can live in, in, in condemnation. I mean, we, you know, when people say, well, you know, just, you know, you just do what you want and live the way you want to live, and then people do, and then they get caught doing whatever, cancel culture, right? So the very people are saying, you know, just do what you want, then like, well, don't do that. And then, you, you know, and that's where, the, that's where we live in this. And so, you know, confession is something, realize, we approach confession. Now, there is a holy God, and if we stand before a holy God and, and before him, you know, bearing everything, we will, we will be torched because God's holy. But the work of Jesus is the fact that when he went to the cross, he took our sin and our shame and provided this blood covering over our life. And so when we, when we receive Jesus and this covering that we have, the Bible says we can approach God's throne with, with boldness and confidence because the blood of Jesus covers us. And so with that veil of that covering, we can approach confession that we're covered but there's a work of confession, not just for our sins to be covered, but the work that he's continued to do in, in Christ's likeness in this process. So, you've heard the phrase before, confession's good for the soul. It is. It's very good for the soul. But I'm going to add to it for this morning, and this thought is this. Confession is not only good for the soul, but it's also a pathway toward healing and wholeness. It's not just confessing sins and making done. It, it, it's actually this work that's happening. And so all is, when you, when you read healing wholeness, I'm like, count me in. I want that. I don't want, I don't want to live life broken. I don't want to live life with a, you know, just limping along. I, I don't want to live life just struggle, struggle, struggle with whatever I'm dealing with and can't get over what I'm dealing with. I want to live, I want to live path toward healing, a wholeness and freedom that's there. And I have a feeling you want that too. I've never heard anybody go, nah, I don't want that. <laughs> we want that in our life. And the way to do this, very simple this morning, it, it, you know this, is, but the first is, is really a vertical confession. It's starting vertical. It's starting with our, our relationship between us and God. Again, we live in this self-esteem culture that's trying to, if you just do better, try harder, you know, think positive thoughts, and you, you're going to be fine, and all this, we are deceiving ourselves. That's, that's what the Bible says. It says, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things beyond cure. Who can understand it? No one on this earth. You can't even understand your own heart. You know this already because you've done stuff and going, why did I do that? I know better. And here I am fooling myself that I'm propping myself up. No, no we, we come to this place that we made. It's part of, if you've ever gone through 12-step in, in recovery, you're admitting that you're powerless and that you need help beyond yourself. But the problem is when we do that, it exposes us. It exposes. Like I said, when you go, just be you, just be who you are, and then you are, and then people go, not like that, and you're out. You know, you're canceled. And yet, as much as we bash cancel culture, the church was really good at that before. Church invented cancel culture. If you're wondering where that came from, it's not the culture, it's the church. 
Church was good for, you know, and again, some places not, not as bad, but places maybe you grew up. Like, if you do this, you're out, or at least you're, you're put over here off the side. You can't really be in the end. And we, and we combat this, and we've done this in, event, in, in evangelicalism the last 60 years. Of, and, and I love it. You know, it's just, you know, just come and you, you receive Jesus to forgive your sins, a personal issue. It's so true. Some of you have done this, though, in a summer camp, or you've done it at a church gathering. You, you, did, it, you did it at VBS. As much as that's important, it's true, and, and your relationship with Christ and going to heaven, here's the thing. We live sometimes with this message that says, okay, now you're saved. Okay, you better step up. Now you better, you know, be, be the standard, hold to this thing, or whatever that thing is, or whatever people put in front of you. And none of us can live like that. And what happens when we don't, we feel the shame, and we feel the condemnation, and then we go like, I'm just not that good a Christian. I guess it doesn't, I, I guess I just can't do this. And then the opposite, the world will say, well, you don't have to live that way. Just be you. And, right, and we get caught up in this thing, and what happens is, there's some false teaching that happens, and this false teaching is this. You just become a Christian, and everything's fine, and everything's good, and if you do some things, just don't let people know you did it, right? That's false teaching, and that was a big issue back in the first century. This was an old thing. Back in the very first century, the big issue this, that, that John, the apostle, writes about later on when the church got going, he says this, if you claim to be without sin, we deceive, we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. What was happening, there was a divergent branch in Christianity that formed, even in the first century, called Gnosticism. And there's a big lesson about Gnosticism. One thing to understand this is that, that if you convert to Christ, they, they're basically saying you don't sin anymore. Or sin doesn't have a problem with you anymore. It's not an issue for you anymore. And this is so damaged and defeating that's even come in our contemporary world. Two extremes is this. If you sin after you become a Christian, well, you must not have been really a Christian. You must not have been a real one. It must have been, they call false conversion. You must not, you must not, it really maybe didn't stick. So you might need to get reconverted again. I'm not going to debate that. But that's what people will feel. Or the opposite is, like, well, you sinned, but, you know, in the Gnosticism, like, yeah, but your, your soul is separate from your body. It, you, can, if you can do whatever, this is with the message back then, you can do whatever you want in your body. It's okay, but your soul's going to heaven. You're, you're good. And that was, of course, Paul talks about in Romans 6, you're cheapening God's grace. You're dragging the grace of God basically through the mud when you're doing that. In fact, Paul, or, or John goes even further about this. He goes, that's not good. He says this, if we claim we have not sinned, look at this. He says, we make him, who's him? God himself, out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Not only are we lying to ourselves, not only are we lying to God, but we're calling God to be a liar. Now, how do we call God to be a liar? The work of salvation, the work of forgiveness of sins on the cross, it didn't really matter. It's not that, you know, it's, it didn't do its work. And that's the lying part. And then this is what he says, John goes on, he says, My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate to the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for ours, but also for the, for the sins of the entire world. He's making it very clear. You can't prop yourself up. You can't do anything and earn your place in God's kingdom. But yet, when you receive Jesus, know this. You're still, you and I are living in a fallen, broken world. And you are going to sin again. You're like, wait a second, I thought Jesus, and, you know, yeah, but you got Monday, you got Tuesday. Well, what about Wednesday, and what about Thursday, and what about Friday, and then Saturday rolls around, and you come back Sunday morning going, I did some sinning this week. And then you come back to church, like, oh, Jesus, and confess it, and I'm starting all over again. Here's the thing, that's real life. <laughs> the co no condemnation for earlier in Christ Jesus. So, so we got to recognize, it, it, are we to live sinless? Yeah, nice try doing that. How about this, though? What if we sinned less? Can that be a goal? I believe so. That's called sanctification. That's called moving in Christ's likeness and being more like Jesus. We, we heard this message, stay away from the bad stuff. And we should. But some of us will do is we'll, we'll get really close to, to sin without really sinning. 
we, we find ourselves getting to a line that, that we get, and what we, what we end up doing is we, 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 we miss the whole point. The point is getting away, as far away from it, but getting closer to Jesus. So that's the process of this work of Christ's life. Now, how do we do some vertical work? Well, first is this. When you come to a place of confession before the Lord, you got to own it. you got to own your sin. What happens a lot of times, we point fingers to what happened to us, right? We do this in counseling. We do this in things, and, and you know, you explore your past. And believe me, the factors of your childhood affect your life, hands down. But you and I, it is not your fault what happened to you in the past, but it's your responsibility what you're going to do today. No matter how horrible it is, and I, I'm not trying to be mean or anything like that, but how horrible it was, guess what? You have a responsibility to do something. You've got to own your sin. You could blame, you could blame your parents. You could blame your ex-wife. You could blame your ex-boss or, you know, neighbor or whatever you want. But until you own it, you have to come to a place. And David, who was, you know, King David, guess, he sinned badly. I mean, adultery and murder that led to it. He said this finally, he goes, For I know my transgressions and my sin have always before me. Again, you and only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Notice David saying, those people, they did this to me, that happened, that, you know. No, he says, I have done this. You've got to own it. You've got to own it. But what do you do with it next? Well, you've got to call it. Call it for what it is. Not only take responsibility, but, but identify what that is. You know, it's funny how we don't talk a lot. I mean, we talk about sin in church, but it's not something of vocabulary. It's like, hey, how are you doing today? Oh, I, I sinned today. Yeah, well, okay, sorry, sir, about that. And they're ringing up your groceries, right? Like, you don't, conf- I mean, there's a place for it, right? You don't, just, we don't use sin. And we know even people don't even like the word sin. It's just like, well, we say, we'll say indiscretions. We'll say mistakes or shortcomings. And we don't call sin, sin. You know, people will kind of go like, well, it wasn't adultery. It was just kind of a, a little fling they had, you know? Adultery. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, you know, it's not, it wasn't, well, it's not a lie, lie. It was just more of an exaggeration. Like, it was just really like a, a white lie. I'm like, I don't know what that is. It sounds racist to me, white lie. I don't even, I don't even know what to do with that. You can look up what that means. I'm sure there's etymology of that. So it might be, who knows. But like, what does that mean, right? How about, how about, you know, instead of gossip, it's like we're sharing. We're just sharing. It's a prayer request about their, their marriage in detail, what they're going through and everything, and they're not in the room, but yeah, they need prayer. Well, why don't we just say they need prayer? Do you have to share all the details with that? Or even, you know what I mean? We do this, and so all of us are victim to this, but all of us are, you know, we're, we're perpetrators of it as well. Let's not minimize, let's not rationalize, let's not excuse away, let's not put a spin on it. Call sin for what sin is. See, David was denial until he got caught, and after that would happen, massive damage to happen if he would have admitted sooner. But he finally did admit his sin. He said this in Psalms 51, Cleanse me with a hiss, I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, for the, the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin, and blot out my iniquity. David's coming, so Lord, I'm just coming clean before you. I'm coming clean, I'm naming it, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this is what it is, and I want to be clean from it. I'm telling you, there's nothing better than be clean. I was talking to a few people um, before service about camping and finding good camp spots and stuff, and if you go camping for a few days, like one night and not showering, you, you're doing okay, but if you've gone two nights not showering and camping, let's just say we're all rolling the windows down on the way home from camp, right? Like, it's right. You're ready for a shower, and everybody else in the car thinks you do as well. And, and so there's nothing better than feeling clean on the outside, but guess what? There's nothing better than feeling clean on the inside. And that work, confession is really, really good for the soul, and it changes. And so when we do, we ask for it. Not only ask for forgiveness, as David does, but look what he says this. And this will speak, I think, to the people that maybe you feel far from God right now. Maybe you feel distant, and maybe you feel like he's almost a million miles away. In fact, if you're online right now, good to have you online, you might be feeling that right now. You're going, I just clicked on this thing, and I don't know, I'm just struggling in my life. And there could just be struggles outside of your life that you can't control, but what can you control? What are some things that you distance yourself from God? And sin can be one of those things that you're part of. 
And David comes to him and says, not only forgive my sin, but then he says, it's creating me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What's he asking for? I want, I want the spirit of God in me. I want to feel your presence again. I don't I, don't, I want you to change me, Lord. I want to be close to you. I want this relationship with you. I want to restore relationship, not just be clean, not just be done. A lot of times we do this like, okay, I said my prayers, I cleaned my slate, we're good to go, right, God? You know, and then we don't do anything with the Lord. Oh, well, then it, things drift back, right? Because we're not in constant relationship, right? You, and so we have this, this, this opportunity. So I encourage you, vertical action step this week is this write your confession and rip it up write your, I always think this is really good write it out write out maybe sin or sins and things and wrongdoings and you know short whatever it is struggles whatever it is like I've done this I, I'm owning it I'm, I'm, I'm you know naming it and I'm asking Lord that you would forgive me and then rip it up and say Lord restore me I want relationship with you and maybe it's doing it every day this week is a, is a way. And then ripping it up, because the Bible says, as far as the east from the west, he blots out our transgressions. Because what happens is you'll bring up what you just asked for forgiveness, and you know, and then, he, then, you know, then God's going, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? Now, I don't know how God can do that in his sovereignty and not remember your sin, but his purpose for us is, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not even an issue for me. You're making it an issue. Don't do that. So letting that go. And then I love this. He says, then... What will be the outcome? I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. This is where we go from vertical to horizontal. Because the work of Jesus in you and what he's doing and he's accomplishing isn't just for you. It's the people that you're with. The, the healing and wholeness that you're seeing in your life. And I, I know many of you where you have non-Christian uh, family members. You have children or you have spouses or you have people that you're trying to model Jesus to. And th what they're doing is they're seeing your life get better in healing and wholeness, and they're like, well, what about my life? And then Dave was able to go, let me tell you where I've been in my journey together. And that leads to horizontal confession. See, vertical confession is, leads to forgiveness, but it's interesting, horizontal confession leads to healing. You're thinking, well, where do you get that? Well, the Bible says this. It's beautiful scripture in James. It says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, we read this sometimes. We're like, wait a second. I'm confessing to God. Okay, that's good, just being God. But now I'm doing it to one another? I'm like, I don't think so, bro. I don't think I'm going to do that. Well, there is a connection of healing to take place. Not only, no doubt, God will forgive our sins. People don't confess. And again, you know, a priest can represent the God. I'm not bashing that at all but really it's it jesus is our high priest he's the one that we can ultimately confess him he brings our our sins to the our holy father he's our advocate to do that right and when we do that we are forgiven but there's this work of confession that brings healing there's a work of grace that takes place let me give you an example of this 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 picture a high school student you know they're cheating on math tests and they're not doing it one time. They're continuing to do it. And they're feeling really, really bad about it, right? Well, they'll continue to cheat on math tests because they're not getting, they're not, you know, they, but they have a conviction. They're, they're like, I don't want to keep doing this. I keep doing this. But, but until they had to break it, until they go to the, the math teacher and say, I've been cheating, <laughs> they're not going to break it. They're, they're not, I mean, it's good they're continuing to do that. And the, the danger of, of, getting, of getting away with cheating on a math test is like, you're kind of, cheating on college exams you, you start cheating on your resume what you really had you, you start cheating on your taxes you start cheating on your spouse che that's the pattern we find in life whatever it might be that minor infraction left on check and lead down a greater problem in our life and i tell you true confession is to break the cycle of sin and remove the burden of guilt so we we suffer to carry us through this life Confession is good for the soul when we confess to one another. But here's the importance of confession. There's a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom when we do it. And this is that you don't just confess to anybody, right? You find safe people in a relationship and community together that you do this with. There are certain things that men should say to men and women should say to women. And I'm not trying to be sexist. I'm not trying to be... I'm not, just understand that there's, there's certain things in a community of people I think is very important. Certain things can be shared together, but there's wisdom in doing that. Finding safe people that when you're in a relationship with, they're not going to judge you. They're going to come along and go, me too. 
They're going to come along and they're going to share they, this burden off their back. Confession breaks this power of guilt. And what I love, what James says, pray for each other that you might be healed. That's the work of confession. Yes, Jesus forgives sins. People don't. But when we confess it to one another, healing process can take place because we're as sick as our secrets. We are. And when we live hidden lives, it's easy to be caught up in that hidden life. And it will come out. Our sins, the Bible says our sins will find you out. Not to scare you, but that's what the Bible says. And so confession, you know, you suddenly think, well, it's going to hurt some people. Well, do it with wisdom. But I've learned this. Every time I've confessed in a safe group of people, I've not felt judged. I felt loved. I've not felt condemned. I felt like I was out there. I was taking a risk. And people came around me, encouraged me, and helped me. And, and, and they, there's this work that happens. I love in the message it says this, another version of this. Make this, to do confession, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you can live together whole and healed. You like that? Whole and healed is when we do this in community together. I, it, Christ the King, you know, we, we have this little mission statement. I just love it because it says what we're doing here. It says, we're here to create authentic Christ-centered communities. Authenticity comes in this place. The way it works is vulnerability. And vulnerability is so hard, especially men. I'm speaking to all the men in the room, because us guys, we don't want it. We want to be macho. We want to admit it wrong. You know, like, you know, like, you know and you're on the golf course, and you're just like, you know, hey, Hey, um, Fred, I'm really struggling with, you know, it's like, I'm just trying to pot, you know. It's like sometimes there's a setting in which we do this. But when we do that, the most manly thing, the most bravest thing you, you can do is, is have a place where you can just say, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I love what Brene Brown, I just love her stuff on vulnerability. She says this, vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. <sighs> Big one there. Vulnerability is not weakness. It's our greatest measure of courage. So men, man up. Women, women up. I don't know if that's a word, but you know what I'm saying? Step up. When you do that, people see you and they embrace you. And I, again, I've never been in a place where people have judged me and put me down and, and, the, and if I'm in the right environment. If you need help with that, I'd love to guide you through. How do I find that? Well, here's the horizontal action step and then we're about ready to pray. Find a friend and build trust. Find a friend and build trust. I'm going to invite our guys to come up here. When you do this, because it's a step towards us, because you're like, I can't tell anybody right now. And that's okay, because there's wisdom in who you need to share this with. But build a friend. And as you build friendship, then, I mean, not the first meeting, go like, hey, it's nice to meet you. Here's my sins I'm going to tell you, okay? <laughs> people are like, uh, this is overshare, okay? This is, you just let the relationship develop, build trust, and at some point you're able to say, you know what? This is, this is what it means to have authentic friendship, and out of that you can share your struggles and come clean, and it's such a beautiful confession. is so good for the soul, but it's also so good for healing and wholeness in, in our lives, not just for us, but a world that so needs it, so needs it. Several years ago, I read a book uh, by Donald Miller. I love everything that Donald Miller writes. He's now a business guy, uh, but he was an author for a while, and he wrote a book called, famous book called Blue Light Jazz. And Donald, uh, he, he, he attended in college. He went to Reed College. And then Reed's been in the news, and especially in 2020, and all that happened. It's the most liberal college in the United States. It's up there. Like, I mean, it's like Woodstock all the time, okay? It's just one of those places that is crazy. And, and they decided, this little Christian group he was a part of, decided to build. Like, there was, like, party scene going on Friday night, crazy stuff going on. And they decided to build a confessional booth in the middle of the square in this college party row, right? And they're like, well, what are we, we're going to have people come in and confess their sins. No, we're going to do the opposite. People are going to come in and we're going to confess our sins to them. Like, what? Why would we do that? Because we've done wrong. You know, not only if our, we want to humble ourselves, like we have not lived up to what it means to be a Christian. We as the church have not stepped in. We have judged people. We have harmed people for the name of Jesus. We have done things personally and offended people and, and hurt people and, 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 you know, 
we want to do this, and, and in fact, it's not just what we didn't, we did and we should, you know, not done. It's the stuff we didn't do. We didn't help the poor. We didn't reach out to the vulnerable and the hurting people. Sins of omission and sins of commission. Commission is the things we, we did wrong. The things we should have done right was omission. And so they had this booth, and Don, Don shares the story. It was his turn to be in there, and, you know, some of the guys a little, have a little tipsy coming in, like, what's this? Am I supposed to confess my sins? He goes, no, I, I'm going to confess my sins. And Don says one time that the guy started crying a little bit. He goes, wow, I can't believe you guys are doing this. And then it was interesting. He said, he, he said people started opening up about their own life. As you go first, right, it opens it up. And he said this. He says, this is the synopsis. All the people who visited the booth were gr- gracious and grateful grateful. Think about it, college students. I was being changed through the process. I think those who came in the booth were being changed too. Wow. Do you see that on the level of authenticity? If we could push it all away, if we could push out shame and guilt and being real, and I know it's a risk. I know we can sometimes be judged for doing something like this, but I tell you, religious people will do that. And some of the most hypoc- uh, hypocritical people will do that because they're dealing with their own stuff as well. And they might push shame, blame toward you. Guess what? They got their own hearts. And when they're pushing against it, it means there's something going on there as well. What if we came honest and openness to a God not of judging us and putting us down and, and condemning us, but a God of love and compassion who came and sent out of great love, sent his own son to come and die for us, to provide not only our forgiveness of our sin, took our shame, took our very failings of ourselves to the cross that we can live. Not only is we'll never be perfect on this earth, but perfection before God, holy and pure before Him, but a work in progress that He's doing. What if we, what if we came our authentic self and did that? Wouldn't that be something not only for our community to build it? Wouldn't, the, wouldn't, the, wouldn't our community want that? Wouldn't it be a community of people that need that, that you, that you know? So let's pray in that way. Will you, will you join me in prayer? This is, Lord, this is uncomfortable today. This is uncomfortable. Because, Lord, we, 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 some of us have dialed in that, you know, we, we, we sinned and then we go to you and we ask for forgiveness and, and, and we know we receive it. And, and, and when we really can't see you or feel you, we know you're there. You're, you are the way maker. You're at work always, and we, we know that. But, and, and yet the thought, the thought of sharing our weaknesses and in, in, in our failings and, and our sin before our brothers and sisters, Lord, that's really tough. But there's a work we want to do. You want us to be vulnerable so we can bring uh, authentic Christian communities together, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to do that. First of all, as we do it, we do it vertical. If there's anyone here that they're just, they need forgiveness, Lord. They need your cleansing. May they say, Jesus, you are faithful and you are just and you will cleanse me from all unrighteousness, Lord. I come before you. Thank you, Lord. I own my sin. I ask you to take it and I, 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 Lord, forgive me. And if you're in this room right now, that might be you. And just say, Lord, do that work. But also join me in prayer for the community of people around you. If you're here right now and you're isolating, you're alone, and your struggles, you're not meant to be that way. There's people in your life. Maybe not yet, but may, may we pray, Lord, will you bring us to the right people, a, a community of people, a friend that we can trust and share all and bear all. And they would do the same. And there would just be this code of silence. There'd be this protection of our lives and there'd be this covering that's there. Lord, will you provide that for those that don't have that? Lord, that out of that, that confession really truly can be this, it's so good for our soul, so good to find healing and wholeness for our lives, but guess what, we have an opportunity in a community that so desperately needs us to just be real in, in our struggles, and what would happen if we really truly did that? Lord, you might not be calling us to build a, build a, build a confessional booth in our cul-de-sac, that's weird, Lord, but you, there's people, Lord, that we can build community with, that need you, Lord, that we can be vulnerable help us to do that in this process. And Lord, what would happen if we live this way, that in in a world that's withering away, that we can actually, our faith can really flourish in something real, because we're staying true and connected to you every step of the way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we close in the song, and I just encourage you, just express to the Lord this moment, maybe there's some prayer, maybe there's some work the Lord's doing in your life. Don't let 
Don't let like, oh, what's next going to block that. Just take this moment, a couple minutes before you leave. And, and we're always here for prayer. Our, our prayer team's available to do that. I'm here as well. Uh, thanks. D- stay connected this summer to this series. There's so much more ahead for us. Have a great day.